Good morning, and thank you for joining the AWS Education Research Seminar Series. We are excited to have Professor Frank Vertfein with us today. He's going to be talking about science at Petascale, advancing global scientific projects through distributed computing. Um, Professor Vertfein is an experimental particle physicist analyzing data from the Large Hadron Collider and is responsible for providing an integrated data and compute platform that advances open science through distributed high throughput computing as executive director of OSG. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Vertbein, who likes to go by simply Frank. Take it away, Frank. Hello, good morning, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll be talking to you about big science with big instruments. Uh, because they, uh, I've uh, changed the title at the last minute because I couldn't, uh, the other one was a mouthful. So um, the uh, abstract that is online is what I will follow. So I will provide an overview of three global science drivers, the Large Hadron Collider, Gravitational Wave Detection, and the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, and uh, elucidating common patterns, but mostly I'll actually be having fun talking about the science. Um, I will towards the end, um, come bring it together, what they have in common, what are the common patterns uh, for the architecture of the global computing infrastructure. And in particular, I will point out what I think the role of AWS can and should be, and probably will be um, in the future for these kinds of large international projects uh, using advancement in computing technologies as their data volumes explodes over the next decade. As part of my talk, I will give you a little bit of science um, and uh, also a little bit of a sense that while these, all three of these projects have had major accomplishments, they're here to stay for another decade or two. And, and uh, I will uh, explain that in terms of the upgrades that they have coming. Um, a disclaimer, uh, Mark R.C. already said that I'm an experimental part of physicist, so I'm a professor of physics at UCSD. And I do my own research with the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. I'll show you, uh, I'll talk about that last of the three. Um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the to gravitation waves or especially ice cube, I'm not much better than an educated layperson, um, meaning I'm by no means an expert in the, in the science that they do. I know enough to talk about it to a lay audience, but that's about it. Um, uh, my group, where I mean with this, the Open Science Grid in general, provides global computer data integration for LIGO, Virgo, and a lot of others, including IceCube. Um, the uh, the uh, Open Science Grid is literally a, a one-stop shopping for anybody from the single researchers in any field in science to these large experiments and large uh, instruments. Um, as promised, I'll start with the science and we'll spend most of my time there. Um, let's start with gravitational wave astrophysics. And let me start by uh, mentioning that there is really four distinct types of observations that these experiments are meant to make, these instruments are meant to make. Um, and the, the one in the top left corner is the one that they got their Nobel Prize for. And um, that is where they actually have made these uh, observations by now. It's the coalescent, it's the uh, uh, the chirp, and I'll show you what that means, uh, of a coalescing binary systems. Basically, two very, very heavy objects that in spiral and ultimately in the last uh, few fractions of a second, um, when the uh, before the, these two masses collide, that in spiral is visible and has been detected. There is these three other phenomena, uh, bursts due to core collapse of supernova or some other uh, weird things that we don't even know about. Um, continuous sources due to uh, uh, spinning objects. You can think of them as uh, either as spinning neutron stars that have a, a that uh, have some kind of deformation, but also or the uh, in spirals before long before they have inspired their. Uh, yeah, frequency is fairly stable. And then the last one is stochastic backgrounds of cosmological or astrophysical uh, um, origin, basically uh, early universe stuff. Um, and the uh, what has been uh, detected so far are two types of phenomena. They're both 
uh, coalescence of very large massive objects and uh, the first one ever observed um, uh, by a gravitation wave detector was with LIGO on September 14, 2015, and it was a binary black hole coalescence. Um, two very large, uh, very massive uh, black holes collided and um, uh, 1.3 billion years ago, and a fraction of a second of the last uh, final in spiral of these was visible in the experiment, in the instrument that, and, that I will be talking about in a second. And more recently, on August 17, 2017, um, a similar kind of binary in spiral was observed, but this time of two neutron stars, very, very massive uh, neutron stars. Um, and the distinction here, while these are both, while the, the, uh, uh, um, the both have the feature of being, um, uh, being chirps, meaning they start at low frequency and then as they collide, you have a, a very brief high frequency uh, um, uh, phenomenon, sort of like this line that you see here, that is actually in, in frequency space um, versus amplitude. And um, the, the, uh, um, the difference in the uh, binary neutron star to the black holes is that binary neutron stars in principle send out gravitational waves, light, and possibly neutrinos. So in principle, a, a neutron star can be observed by telescopes, gravitation wave detector, and ice cube, in theory. This one in particular was observed both by telescopes, um, ground-based and space-based, and by uh, LIGO. And uh, the, seeing the light is the ultimate confirmation that the gravitational wave signal that was seen is not from a black hole collision. Um, what I want to do is, given that uh, uh, un unless you've lived under a rock or something, you've probably heard about this before, but you, what you probably haven't, don't know much about is what's the physics actually. And some of the physics of LIGO is very easy to understand. I teach it in uh, the third quarter um, uh, uh, introductory physics courses at UCSD. I spend a, a, a one lecture where I just talk about fun stuff, and uh, typically the fun stuff is gravitational waves. So I'm taking slides from that uh, intro physics um, to explain to you what gravitational waves are and how what LIGO looks like and why LIGO looks the way it looks um, before I then dive into the future of LIGO. Um, so the simplest way of thinking about this is that you have a very massive body, and that massive body deforms space-time around it. And this is depicted here by the yellow thing is a massive body. And imagine that space-time would be a two-dimensional sheet rather than a four-dimensional space and time, then this body would deform the area around it similar to depressing this sheet. Now imagine that this body suddenly would disappear. For example, a, a, a merger colliding and the collision being much smaller in mass than the original two masses of the two objects. That's literally what uh, LIGO sees. Then this sheet underneath would start oscillating and you'd get sort of the same kind of phenomenon as you see when you drop a pebble into water and you see the ripples going outwards um, uh, radially. And that's ultimately what is happening uh, in gravitational waves that we've observed. You have these two bodies spin around each other and then they collide. A lot of mass dissipates in terms of a wave and that waveform propagates through the universe. Um, now, what does gravitational wave look like? They're actually quite different, but still similar to waves that you're familiar with, like sound waves or light waves. And what makes them different is that they have, just like uh, uh, light waves have a, a, a structure in terms of a polarization um, with an electromagnetic field, electric field and, uh, and uh, magnetic field, um, gravity waves are have a structure in that they, as they pass through space, they stretch space in a pattern that is sort of like pulling cloth uh, uh, sideways in two different directions. So for one for uh, one part of the period, space is extended in the x-axis, meaning stretched in the x-axis and contracted in the y-axis. And in the next part of the period, it is contracted in the x-axis and expanding in the y-axis. That's basic, and that oscillates 
uh, it's as the wave passes you or uh, um effectively and then you can do Fourier transformation and uh, and uh, you can of course have overlapping uh, frequencies and get all kinds of interesting more uh, general sound quote unquote you can almost think of it as sound just like you analyze uh, as a a, a a sound that you hear into and decompose it into its, its Fourier spectrum of waves, you ultimately decompose the stretching of space into its Fourier transformed frequency domain. And you'll see some of these uh, pictures uh, later. Um, I should mention that uh, we agreed with the organizers from AWS that I will talk and then at the end, uh, you will get to ask questions. Uh, so uh, just uh, remember all the questions you have or send them in and I will get back to these slides as you answer question. So given that gravitational waves are an expansion contraction of space itself, um, if, you had a, if you had a circle of detectors, then that circle of detectors would contract in this way and would go back and forth as shown here in the top. Now, what they actually do is they implement something which is called a, a laser interferometer. It's a, a called a Michelson interferometer because uh, Michelson uh, in the early 1900s used it to uh, do experiments with light and got a Nobel Prize for it. it ultimately, um, the, the, what's therefore happening is as the wave contracts the x-axis here on the left and uh, expands the y-axis, you have a length difference between the, the two arms of the interferometer. And that length difference leads to an interference pattern in the detector here. So this is the source, um, uh, it's a, a large arch laser, and this is the detector in, uh, schematically. And so you see the difference in length between the two arms as a shift or the change in difference in length between the two arms as a shift of the interference pattern of the light that goes that bounces off in these two arms and uh, as you go to the opposite direction the interference pattern shifts to the other side so you uh, effectively detect a changing interference pattern and by measuring fringes of an interference pattern in these detectors um, and now now imagine doing this all at very large scale um, these two pictures are the two LIGO observatories um, one is in Hanford, uh, uh, Washington State, and one is in Livingston, in uh, Louisiana, near Baton Rouge and near Richland, Washington. Um, and the, the interferometers are basically identical to a large extent, and they have, they are the arms here that I've indicated here. This piece um, is four kilometers long because as space is stretched, um, an ideal wave would come directly top down onto these two uh, 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 or, um, onto these two arms and be perfectly oriented to maximally stretch the space against the two arms and therefore would uh, having a longer arm means the total uh, change is the absolute uh, value of the change is larger and therefore detectable. And in fact, light bounces, light traverses this is length, laser light traverses the lengths thousands of times. It basically bounces back in a cavity here. Um, and here's the map which, uh, of the US. Uh, so you can see where these two things are located. They are located a, a, a large distance away and oriented in such a way that a, you can make a coincidence measurement and you can start identifying where in space the wave came from. Um, if you had a third one, you could basically triangulate. Um, it, and if you have a fourth one, you can triangulate all the time, even if the, uh, no matter where the wave comes from, uh, even if you have unfortunate polarization such that one of the instruments or the other doesn't see anything. Because uh, you can, of course, imagine that if the wave has a polarization such that uh, these two arms get extended and stretched and, and contracted uh, in sync, um, then uh, you see nothing, right? So, um, that's basically what uh, uh, how LIGO functions. There's an enormous amount of technical details that I, I am uh, not talking about. Um, and voila, that led to the Nobel Prize in Physics of 2017. It went to these three people. Um, 
and it went to these people for observing what I show here on the right. And literally what you see here is the strain in 10 to the minus 21, uh, 21 uh, in units of 10 to the minus 21, and you can sort of think of this as, as the amount of space change in meters, sort of. Um, so what they literally are capable of measuring distance, changes in distance smaller than the size of a proton uh, by many orders of magnitude. So this is an enormous technical uh, uh, technical uh, uh, um, uh, feat. And what you see is the last part of the in spiral. And this here, um, it sort of is a cheer like rip, um, meaning going up in frequency as the two just are coll colliding. And this very uh, um, specific um, uh, feature is what is being searched for in order to find, find binary coalescence. And that's what they found. Um, uh, the future of this is many of these instruments, I already alluded to this, that there is a global quest to point back into the universe to understand not just that these things happen, but the way they're coming from and what the objects are that have caused them. And in order to do this, at least you need three so that you can do or, uh, a pointing into the sky into an area. And ideally you need at least four and uh, preferably even five in order to guarantee A, that one of them can be down at any given moment in time and B, that you have some um, over constraint on the direction where things came from even when the polarization of the wave is unfortunate so that one of them doesn't see anything. Uh, because of the orientation of the wave as it comes in. Um, so we have multiple instruments working together. Ultimately, there is three right now in operation, LIGO, uh, uh, the two ones from LIGO and the one from Virgo. They actually are live only less than a third of the year. And I'll show you the, their schedule uh, in a second. But before I show you the schedule, I want to show you something that is the uh, um, detector characteristics of sorts. So what is shown here is the frequency um, uh, uh, on the x-axis and the measure of the noise, which uh, they call the strain noise, um, uh, on the y-axis. So what you can, should think of is as these in instruments get better and better, these, the curve versus frequency moves down uh, from uh, what was O2 refers to the second observing year, that was last year. Um, the last observing year, we're right now is just starting 03. And um, as you improve, as you lower the noise to go from 02 to A LIGO to A plus, um, as they call it, as you improve the noise, you effectively increase the amplitude sensitivity to a wave. And the amplitude goes um, like the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, as you improve the sensitivity, you effectively can see the same kind of wave further away. And therefore, the volume that you're covering scales like R cubed, of course, because R is a distance. And that means that as you improve noise by factor two, you should be seeing a factor eight as many waves because you're covering um, eight times the volume for twice the sensitivity. And that is the origin of this massive expansion of measurements expected in the next few years. Whereas we right now have seen about a dozen, um, a dozen waves um, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 that has been observed. In 2021, they're expecting about 100, 2024, about 1,000 per year. and uh, and and um, as you go further into the future, uh, this shows you here the expected amount of running. So the x-axis is literally time, um, starting in 2015. And as you see here, the different years, 01, 02, we're right now in 03, what you see here is a distance measurement, an astronomical distance measurement of the distance that you have sensitivity for a solar mass type a black hole collision. Um, so 120 uh, uh, megaparsecs, um, uh, or we started with 80 megaparsecs and are getting to 330. 
So that is a factor of um, uh, four in the, and uh, roughly a factor of four. So over that period, that means four to the third power is the number of uh, in increase in num uh, number of sources visible or that one should expect. Um, if you then look further into the future, um, now we're talking about the second generation of advanced detectors. Um, in the early 20s, there is uh, uh, future improvements. In the late 20s, is the last big improvement in current facilities. In other words, what's happening until the late 20s is you take the existing two arms that I showed you, and you improve the instrumentation inside these large facilities. And then by the uh, mid to end 30s, these facilities are basically done. And in parallel to running out of uh, uh, these facilities, a new type of detectors will be built um, and new facilities which look completely in, a, a different. And that will then continue running into the 40s and so forth. So there is uh, a more than 20 year uh, future plan for these kinds of detections. And um, in addition to what uh, these detectors have planned is they analyze the data themselves and they give themselves an 18 month period to milk their data to their heart's content. Uh, a, a, you can call it an 18 month proprietary period. And after that, data becomes public. And two, at this point, O1 and O2, the first two running periods are already public. O2 became public in, in, in uh, early March 2019. And so there's a community of scientists that exploit the open data that is slowly emerging. And the Open Science Grid supports both the public data, so it, it supports people analyzing the public data, and it supports uh, LIGO, the, the collaboration itself, uh, uh, analyzing its private data while it is still private. Um, now let me switch gears here and switch from, from uh, LIGO to IceCube. And IceCube is a very different kind of experiment, but that ultimately does correlated science in some sense. I told you that neutron stars, um, for example, ice cube, uh, as the name might indicate already, it's a cube of ice instrumented. Uh, it's just that the cube is large. It's a, uh, uh, it's a kilometer cubed. And so a cubic kilometer of ice at the South Pole is instrumented with a little bit more than 5,000 optical sensors. The optical sensors, uh, sort of a picture of an optical sensor here, they're submerged into the ice on long strings and uh, the active volume is basically a, a, a thousand meters deep in the ice. And then inside there, you have a cubic a ice volume, a cubic a, a kilometer cube ice volume to detect something. And this is what the laboratory looks that is on the top of the surface. And this facility does a lot of different science. And I will restrict myself only to high energy astrophysics because there's a lot of overlap uh, there with trying to uh, uh, see phenomena in uh, uh, ultimately in light neutrinos and gravitational waves at some point in the future. And why why neutrinos? What's special about neutrinos? Why can't we just do all of this with light? And the answer is in this plot top here, where it shows on the x-axis energy in electron ball and the y-axis distance. And it so happens that if you are uh, have very high energy uh, um, photons, they actually interact on their way to us and are basically uh, um, impossible to detect because they don't get to us. Uh, they they um, um, uh, only, basically photons from large distances at high energies never reach Earth. Um, however, as I'll show you in, on the next slide, the same kind of phenomena that sends us photons also sends us neutrinos. And it so happens that the neutrino spectra of these highest energies is um, effectively uh, completely clean because any neutrinos that we get from the sun or cosmic rays um, are very low in energy. And uh, that kind of atmospheric neutrinos peter out long before these highest energy neutrinos from uh, cosmological distances or from um, co uh, cosmic origin, uh, extrastellar, uh, out of our stellar su system. And uh, so that's in a way uh, fortunate. Um, so the first observation of such neutrinos was made was published in 2013 by IceCube. And what you see here 
is these black points are what Ice Cube detected. The red points is the data from a, one of the satellites uh, dedicated to sort of do this kind of science. And you can see as the energy increases on the X axis, photons are no longer visible as expected because they don't get to us. Whereas the neutrinos uh, get to us because neutrinos interact very, very weakly. Um, and so let me explain this a little bit uh, because now that we know that um, these neutrinos exist out there uh, and uh, phenomena exist in our universe that are so violent that they produce neutrinos at these very, very large energies. Um, the question is, of course, what are these sources? And I'll explain to you also how they are detected. And the hypothesis is that there's some kind of cosmic accelerator that is ultimately not really fully understood. They would push out protons which would, um, uh, uh, in the synchrotron radiation field, um, interact to become uh, uh, pi pluses, and the pi plus decays to a muon, which it sends off a muon neutrino, which decays to an electron, which sends on an anti-muon neutrino and an electron neutrino. And it's these neutrinos out of this cascade chain that get observed. On the other hand, the same proton may also interact and send out a pi zero, which gives you two photons. So the very same identical mechanism that gives you the neutrinos can also give you, um, uh, give you photons. And therefore, sources that give you neutrinos will always also have shine in the in light. And given that there is a large spectrum of, of uh, stuff that gets thrown out of these cosmic accelerators, you will get some photons that are low enough in energy that we can see them, and some neutrinos that are high enough in energy that we can detect them above background from, uh, from uh, cosmic rays. And um, given that the very reason why neutrinos get to us and not interact in the interstellar medium or anywhere else in between and uh, from their origin to us uh, is that they interact weakly, but that also means that they don't interact in our detector much. That means we need a very large array of ice instrumented. And this the idea of instrumenting ice is what made it possible to make these kinds of measurements because it so turns out that ice is actually fairly uniform uh, under the South Pole because it hasn't been disturbed in, in a very long time. And we call this multi-master astrophysics and it's sort of the leading edge. Um, uh, the most, the hottest topic in astrophysics in some sense is this uh, multi-master astrophysics where messengers are photons, neutrinos and gravitational waves. And you want to see all of them from the same object, point back to that object and figure out, oh yes, this was such and such an object we know a lot of it uh, about it from these different messengers, and voila, we understand the science. Um, that, of course, gives you a pointing resolution requirement on Ice Cube. And as you can imagine, you have a, a complicated, you have a neutrino that at, at, at produces a, a, a muon backwards, basically, to here. So you can, what happens in the detector is the backward reaction to or what is happening in at the cosmic origin. You create a muon. And the muon then uh, interacts with the ice and creates photons, and the photons are detected in these detectors that I showed you earlier in the in, uh, in the 5,000 phototubes. And that means there is a pointing resolution challenge. How do you point back once you, all you see is light in the detector? And um, that's where a lot, the vast majority of their processing power is actually uh, done in photon propagation through ice, in order to understand the details of the ice. What you see here on the right is the profile of the effective scattering coefficient for photons versus wavelength and depth. So in other words, at different depths in the ice, the ice behaves very differently as it interacts with light. And in order to be able to point back, you need to know exactly what the light traveled through and therefore need to simulate the proponent propagation of the light. And therefore you need massive amounts of GPUs. And that's basically a, uh, the reason why Ice Cube is a major uh, uh, consumer of CPU resources. It also tends to produce a lot of data because uh, the output data of these simulations is large, um, petabyte scale. Um, then, uh, the, uh, in addition to having seen that these neutrinos exist, they also have the first multi-master observation of an object that um, is tracked both in photons and in neutrinos. So what we've seen or what they have detected 
and it's published in, in a science article, it's the first location of a source of very high energy neutrinos. Um, they literally found one neutrino interacting in the in the ice cube detector on uh, September 22nd, 2017, and that one neutrino was immediately, uh, an alert was sent out to the uh, community of, of astronomy that uh, has uh, telescopes ready to look, and they oriented their telescopes in the, the, the direction that, LIGO, uh, that ice cube was pointing, and basically mapped out the entire sky there, and multiple of these uh, telescopes found light at the same time. And that coincidence measurement is the first evidence that we know the source because the source was a well-known blazer from previous measurements. Um, and so now where is IceCube going with this? Um, there's a future plans of multiple upgrades. In essence, they're near term, they're adding more phototubes to the deep core to increase granularity. And long term, they want to extend the instrument volume at smaller granularity expand the total, uh, 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 make an even smaller granular deep core, and um, add a surface to the array. In other words, increase the volume, increase precision in the core, and add, a, add a, an even larger surface detector to, have, to better distinguish from surface air showers from uh, the uh, neutrinos that uh, only interact in the ice. And therefore, it in true improves if they get this funded, which is uh, yet, as yet not approved, um, they, this would improve the detector for low and high energy neutrinos and would make um, ice cube relevant into the late 30s, uh, possibly uh, uh, 40s. Uh, so another experiment, this experiment would also be running for another 20 years or so. Um, that gets me to the experiment that I actually work on, which is CMS. Um, this here is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. It's another massive instrument, as you can see, this here is an aerial photo of Geneva. This is the Geneva airport. The Mont Blanc is over here. And the ring is 27 kilometers. And inside this ring is the CMS detector, the Atlas detector. Uh, and those are the two big experiments that compete against each other. Um, the Large Hadron Collider is 27 kilometers in circumference. It collides protons and protons and energies in a range of this. We basically started out small because we had a, a, a catastrophic uh, incident the year we were supposed to start, and uh, and then we were very careful and slowly are we increasing energy ever since. Right now we're at 13 TV. Um, there's 115 billion protons in a bunch. A bunch is, used to be about 30 centimeters on 30 centimeters um, in in uh, in uh, um, 30 centimeters on 30 microns. 30 microns in xy, 30 centimeters in z. Current operation is actually was more like five centimeters in Z, so I, I forgot to update this slide. Um, what do we do? We try to create a Big Bang in the laboratory, and we literally recreate the early universe in a sense, and we gain insight by colliding protons at the highest energies possible um, in order to measure production rates, masses, and lifetimes of the stuff that we produce, and understand the decay phenomenology of the stuff that we produce. And so, in a sense, we have a a collision of a compact object, stuff lies all over the place, and we have a fairly hermetic detector that then tries to understand, reconstruct everything that happened in the collision, and then understand what exactly happens in the most interesting collisions. And from this, we derive spectroscopy as well as dynamics of elementary particles. Progress is made by going to higher energies and more intense beams. Basically, brighter beams give you more sensitivity to or events that are more rare, higher energies give in the protons, proton beams gives you uh, access to, uh, um, to science at higher energies and therefore earlier into the universe. And spectroscopy, what does this mean? That is, uh, what are the particles that exist and what are their properties? Dynamics means what are the forces and the interactions between these particles? What's the physics that is actually going on here? Um, and um, this also has gotten the Nobel Prize, so has led to a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was actually received by the theorists who predicted in the 60s that the uh, uh, Higgs boson exists, that there is a mechanism that uh, explains mass uh, uh, in, the, in elementary particles, and that mechanism needs a particle to, that can be measured in experiments, and it was measured for the first time in uh, in uh, 2012, 
And then 2013, these two fellows got the Nobel Prize for predicting that such a thing should exist and, uh, and the experiment should go after it. It took them from, it took them, it took the experimental community 40 years to find this because it was very, very hard to produce and measure. This is the kind of instrument that you use in order to measure these collisions. It's a massive detector, um, uh, five stories high. Um, and here's a little bit of trivia on the detector. It has 80 million electronic channels. If you take four bytes per channel and it uh, uh, digitizes 40 megahertz, that means it produces 10 petabytes per second of information. That's, of course, insane. Um, nobody can do science with something like this. So what we do is we do zero suppression. We read out only channels that have something above threshold in them. That gets you about a factor of 1,000 suppression. And then we get about a factor of 100,000 by throwing away things that are no longer interesting. Basically, my father's and grandfather's physics is no longer uh, stored. We only write out, out in real time. We make a decision what physics is interesting. And um, this is run by a collaboration of 2,000 scientists, about 180 institutions in 40 countries. And it's 20, made, 20 meters long, 16 meters in diameter, and weighs 12,500 tons. And what's most interesting from a computing perspective, this is the expected amount of data produced per year. As you see, we're sort of now at the, at the tens of petabytes, and something magical happens in 2026 that we get a massive upgrade of the accelerator. And with that massive up upgrade of the accelerator, the beams become much brighter, and we take many more collisions. And, we, and uh, those many more collisions um, leads to uh, an exabyte per year of data taking in when we run after 2026, or uh, so roughly in 2027, probably onwards, we expect an exabyte of data. Um, what is common across all of these instruments? Um, the commonality is really the sociology. What I'm showing you here is the LIGO calibration uh, in form of um, uh, their, uh, uh, how do you call these, their, their, their stamps or whatever, their, their um, symbols. Um, LIGO is a 1,200 member collaboration across 100 institutions in 80 countries. I told you here that CMS is a 180 institutions of 40 countries. So these are sort of same scale in sociology. And what this means is if you have a truly global scientific instrument that is unique, meaning there's only one of them in the in, in, uh, on the planet or a few of them on the planet that are run by, they're operated by truly global collaborations. That also means you're dealing with tens of funding agencies. And that means that tens of funding agencies want to provide computing for these experiments, but they don't want to send cash to Switzerland or to uh, the US in, in order to pay for their computing. Um, they want to uh, support infrastructure in their home countries um, uh, because they want to support their national scientific community. And voila, you therefore have a requirement that you integrate computing infrastructure the world over. And that's what the Open Science Grid does together with WSCG, its partners internationally. And to show you that this is not just talk, I've given you here pie charts. Um, and these pie charts uh, is the annual computing. Each pie chart is a location in the world where that computing is happening. So this is LIGO computing, IceCube computing. And then for CMS, I wanted to show you the data distribution because both the data and the computing are equally distributed. Each one of these pie slices is, a, uh, is basically a storage, a, a, a disk infrastructure a, uh, um, at a cluster somewhere in the world. And you can see that the largest cluster makes up only 20% of the total disk space. So these are truly global computer data infrastructures that the, any, uh, that the finding agencies um, uh, have funded. And given that everything is, is globally distributed already, integrating AWS is at the natural extension of the global infrastructure. And this is possible because ultimately applications are geniusly parallel. Um, we could today, we have the means today to run computing for these experiments at an, extra, an incredible scale. Um, this here shows you the uh, infrastructure scalability versus version number. 
And so we today could run an infrastructure with about 200,000 batch slots or 200,000 VMs. If you were to implement this in AWS, you'd be running something in the, in the, of the order of 8 million CPU cores or 1.6 million GPUs if you use the largest VMs AWS offers today. These are, of course, completely unaffordable. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that the scalability of running these signs is phenomenal. Um, it is ingeniously parallel because the data that you can and separate it out in jobs that analyze different data, small uh, slices of the total data, and the data is, is independent of each other because it's a time series ultimately. Um, I wanted to quickly do a little bit of advertising um, uh, and um, uh, for OSG. OSG federates, uh, the computer federation of OSG is about 100 clusters worldwide. Um, and I'm showing you here the locations inside the US and uh, uh, the Americas, sort of. There's also something in Brazil, which isn't, didn't fit on the map anymore. Um, in aggregate today, it's about 200,000 Intel x86, and the largest amount of GPUs that we've ever had in a day is 2,000 GPUs, mostly gaming GPUs, um, because uh, uh, IceCube basically doesn't require uh, double precision. They run all single precision. And the, these are true federations in the owner's determinant policy. You can bring your cluster, and I, I would love to see a, a, a new clusters, more clusters on OSG, and many of them allow then multiple sign stakeholders, uh, often LIGO, IceCube, the LHC, and whatever, anybody uh, uh, who wants to use this. We have economists, we have literally anything that you can imagine as science. In addition, there's the Data Federation. The Data Federation is much younger. Uh, literally, we've built the Data Federation within the last um, uh, few years, and it is what you're seeing here is the uh, Internet 2 backbone, uh, which is the academic internet. You're seeing here the uh, cloud peering points that Internet 2 has in Chicago, um, Ashburn, um, and uh, in the Dallas area. And you also see where we have located origins and caches. In essence, we're building, we've built a content delivery network like Netflix, but for all of open science. And it's completely federated in that. Um, there's no owner of it. Um, the owners come to us to the table. The owners of hardware come to us to the table. They bring their data with them, and then we call them origins. Or they provide us with caches in order to hide latencies and, uh, and reduce network traffic. So ultimately, what we want to build is all origins on all data and is in all, all relevant. So we are looking for customers to scale out the number of origins. And we're looking for people who want to add caches in different places. Uh, for example, right now, we have one in Europe, in Amsterdam. We're in the process of building out um, three more locations in Europe and uh, three more locations in the US um, in order to grow this. And here you, down here, you see a little bit of the, uh, uh, of the evidence, the measured basic use and uh, the measured reuse of data. Reuse of data ranges from in fact, 15 times to 30,000 times. In order to this, I'm showing here just to show that caching actually makes sense. Um, if you reuse the same data 30,000 times, then you don't want to send it over the Atlantic 30,000 times if you can help it. Um, now coming to why AWS is really interesting to this, and it's elasticity. IceCube and LIGO have cosmic events that are of high value. I've shown you this when I discussed the science. And really, ideally, they'd elastically scale out to get best possible parameters as quickly uh, uh, as possible. And that's just of value to the science. In addition, IceCube and CMS are driven by annual simulations and or reconstruction campaigns. Basically, as we understand our instruments better, we have new releases with better calibrations, better software, better reconstruction software, in IceCube's case, better ICE models that then when we reanalyze the data, that warrants a complete reanalyze the data, a complete redo of all the simulations, and therefore an improvement in the science that we can do. And these are annual campaigns, and the annual campaigns would be, the science would be much better off if we didn't take 12 months, but say three months, one month. And that kind of elastic scale out is what we're looking for 
from AWS uh, and its uh, commercial competitors. So fundamentally, most of the processing is furthermore preemptible, and thus we would love to uh, uh, benefit from things like the spot market. We basically want it. We're cheap. We're scientists. We don't have the. Uh, we don't make profits. We don't have. We don't have a commercial profit at, at, um, margin that we can use in order to pay for our computing. Therefore we make our computing such that we can use the cheapest resources they can get our hands on. And right now, that is the spot market of AWS, basically, and the equivalent at, at uh, its competitors. And so what I would like to see is that um, let Amazon become infinitely large to support all of the commercial uh, um, uh, computing that is necessary, that makes profits, and run the economy. And then we use whatever the economy does not need instantaneously at the given moment in time, and we give it back to industry, and we get a price break because we're maximally flexible and can use the spot market. That's basically my mental model for how to get elasticity. And we get elasticity because our needs are tiny compared to the world's economy. Um, that's basically what it boils down to. And, uh, and uh, that's my pitch to how we want to use uh, AWS and its competitors. Um, summary and conclusion, so that there's time for questions. Um, humanity has built extraordinary instruments by pooling human and financial resources globally. And I'm really stressing here, it's the pooling of human resources, which is ultimately the most costly in these experiments. These experiments are expensive to build, but they're even more expensive to operate, maintain, design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The human cost is enormous. Um, and so in order to do these, you need to have the intellectual capital of the entire world aggregated into these social environments, which are these collaborations. And given that the entire human capital is, is maximally distributed across the world, um, we have a computing uh, organized for these large collaborations that fits into a globally uh, distributed model, is ingeniously parallel, and therefore also fits perfectly onto the cloud. We don't need um, supercomputers that are massively, uh, that have very high low latency bandwidth. Um, um, and so we can work with the cloud without having a, a, a funky uh, interconnects. Um, the, in addition, we are preemptible, therefore we can make, we can uh, use the leftovers of the cloud. And the scientists would, prefer, would much prefer elastic scaling rather than work with what is funded steady state, because it is hugely beneficial if you can get work done that you want to get done for a year, and you do it in a month or in three months rather than in a year, and spend the rest of the time analyzing the data that you have just produced. Um, because ultimately, we're in the business of turnaround and, uh, uh, and analyzing the data that we process and, and the simulation that we process. Thank you very much. I open it up for questions. Thank you, Frank. That was amazing. What a great presentation. Um, so for those of you who are on the call, if you do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the GoToWebinar questionnaire box, and I will be reading them aloud. So it looks like we have our first question in. Um, it says, you talked about AWS computing capability supporting as a natural extension of a globally integrated reef research infrastructure. Tell us more about which other AWS capabilities besides SPOT might be helpful for scientific research collaboration in the future. Let, 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 me, uh, let me give you a, a sense by a, a Duncan experiment. Now, you've all heard about uh, the exascale boondoggle um, in the, uh, in the uh, DOE uh, where we're building, the world tries to build the next exaflop computer. We could run an exaflop today. And so how would we do it? IceCube could justify an exaflop hour or maybe an exaflop day of computing. And how would that get done? IceCube would use about 80,000 80, um, uh, V100s 
if you do a single precision of 80,000 B B100s, you'd get about a 1.2 exaflops of 32-bit, uh, if I uh, remember correctly. Um, now, in order to do this, um, Ice Cube would, would uh, elastically scale out, right? But the, the exaflop is in GPU computing. In order for Ice Cube to actually get science done, it needs to do about a somewhere between 100 terabytes and a petabyte per exaflop hour of GPU computing it needs to produce in, in the input to the simulation. Basically, it's the photon in ice that is ultimately the GPU stuff, but it's the, the photon in ice simulation requires first to simulate a neutrino going through the ice, interacting, making a muon or electron. That muon or electron then showers and creates the photons that then get simulated as their propagation goes through the ice. So all of the other stuff, all of this other science is actually uh, CPU rather than GPU. And CPU, we have plenty elsewhere. And so one would use a, say, 100 terabyte um, a space, put all of this, uh, flow this slowly into AWS or ship it in via a snowball in, for a, a, a petabyte or 100 terabyte uh, data into AWS. You'd use um, S, uh, S3, uh, you use storage space in AWS to park this, and then you'd run for an hour at exascale, and that hour would, would uh, consume this 100 terabytes to petabyte of input data and spit out about a petabyte of output data in an hour. And this kind of exaflop hour of sorts would use multiple different pieces of AWS. It would scale out the, it would have a large scale ingestion of data. It would have a large scale uh, uh, photon propagation through GPUs on, on any GPU that you have in AWS. We, we don't care. We can run on K80s. We can run on, I think you call them X, M6s or whatever they're called. Um, uh, the uh, uh, T4s when you get them, uh, we don't care um, uh, because we, we require only single precision. Something like that shows you that you'd park in dynamically data you'd pull the data into um, uh, large scale, uh, possibly 80,000, 100,000 large scale uh, uh, GPU computing. You, the output gets put back into AWS and then we send it back at our leisure, no longer uh, using the very expensive 100,000 V100s in this one hour. This is the kind of elasticity in the most extreme example, and we could do this today. We just don't have the money for it. If you want to, uh, uh, if you want to send and uh, send me a check, I'd be willing to uh, do this uh, today. Um, basically, uh, we have all the technology. Um, it would probably take Ice Cube time to uh, uh, get this uh, set up, and uh, but fundamentally, we have the means to do these kind of things. Does that answer your question? I, I believe it did. Thank you, Frank. Um, so it looks like we have another question. Um, for other science researchers considering a collaboration using AWS, what advice might you be able to offer, especially about ways of how to economically conduct research? That's a very good question. Um, le uh, let me start. Uh, let me start with, uh, with um, the, the application. I think you want to be have an application, you want to have control over your application such that you can make it run relatively short, make it run on relatively many different kinds of, of uh, uh, VMs. And then you send us an email at uh, help at uh, opensciencegrid.org and we help you with the plumbing and make it all work. And the paramount issue to be cost effective is that you can use spot market because that's about a fact of 10 cheaper than not spot market and uh, then and reserved instances and then in addition in order to be using spot market effective you can't run things you have to fit first into any and all vms that uh, we can uh, scrounge and secondly 
you would want to not run for 24 hours or 48 hours because you might get preempted in the in the me meantime and you'd lose what you've accomplished. So uh, hour long run times are better for this rather than day long run times. Uh, you need to uh, work on your memory footprint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to fit in all of this. And you, uh, uh, and then there is one other thing that is strictly financial. You need to buy your your Amazon computing by an institution that does not charge overhead. And um, there are such institutions now in academia. UCSD is one of them. And I'm told by my uh, CIO that he's open for business and he's willing to uh, receive subcontracts for, for buying computing for you. He's willing to run an account for you if you want to get a, avoid the overhead at your institution. Um, basically, if you are getting charged 55, 60% or 70% as some of our premier institutions in the US in, over, in IDC, then uh, finances are no longer, uh, then obviously you don't care about finances because that's just crazy. Um, does that answer the question? I think those are all great suggestions. Um, we have another question. Do you have any cost number comparison of data analysis with physical clusters and with AWS? I'm not, I'm not uh, sure that I'm supposed to share this. Um, uh, the, so basically, um, let me put it this way. At this point, um, AWS has a couple of things working against it. And one is that I, as a PI at an academic institution, generally do not pay overhead on um, IDC on purchases of hardware, whereas in most, almost all institutions, I pay IDC on purchases on Amazon. That's the first one. I've mentioned that already. The second one is that I don't pay for uh, power either. And in, I don't know exactly for my cluster at UCSD, but I know for some of my European collaborators, over the lifetime of the hardware, the cost in hardware and the cost in energy is, is about 50-50. So there is a factor of two price advantage that you get as an academic by buying the hardware over what you get by paying for hardware in Amazon. And that, of course, works against Amazon in a big way. Um, and the there is public, the only public document that I know that people have actually been very careful to calculate it is not from a university, but from uh, the DOE, Fermi National Lab. It's uh, processing on Amazon. It did the calculations and came out and made an estimate of what it cost them, including IDC and including power and including operating equipment in, at, at home. And um, if uh, I can find this as reference, if this is interesting to people, and we can and attach it to my uh, talk um, later, um, uh, Sanjay probably knows where to find this as well as I do, because he was the one who uh, started this project with Fermilab back then. Um, and so uh, the and the estimate in the end was the ratio of on-premise on Amazon divided by on-premise was 0 0.7 plus minus 0 0.3, basically within the error of these estimates, it was the same cost. Now, they minimized the disk space they used inside Amazon because the single largest, in my experience, the single largest um, variable, a compute cluster, everybody knows how to run and everybody runs it roughly at the same price. Storage infrastructure, people run at hugely differing price points. There are a factor of two, three, five, ten in price between how people run their storage. And um, that depends entirely on what you're trying to do, the performance characteristics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's and storage in my community, in the three communities that I've talked about, is dirt cheap. We basically do storage the cheapest way possible. We don't have global file systems because it's Typically, or if we have it, we have very little requirements in writing. We we basically we write once, read many, and therefore we can get away of not having in, um, uh, the kind of 
store synchronicity that you would want uh, build into a supercomputer and therefore we're much much cheaper and therefore amazon costs of storage is not nowhere close to competitive to what i can build on premise so and so this, i'm sorry oh, frank um i just thought this was a good segue for our final question we do have one about okay. storage um it's curious about the profile of the storage caches what kind of performance do they typically require how dynamic is the cache? I'm thinking about the potential of cloud services for supporting storage cache. Yeah, and um, uh, we've talked about it and uh, it's on my to-do list to have cloud services. Right now, given that, that my customers are all, all cheap, uh, basically the academics who don't have money, um, we have not done that. And the caches that we, we have instead deployed the philosophy, let's put our caches as close to AWS as possible and compute in AWS and pull in from read by the network to those caches because input to Amazon is free, output costs. And uh, so, um, and the, uh, the caches we have deployed are in the neighborhood of about uh, 30 to 100 terabytes each. They are SATA only. Um, they have, uh, they uh, tend to be anywhere between 10 gig to 100 gig connected. And I can send people if they care a, an extra shopping list, the kind of things that we've bought in some cases, we've started experimenting with SSDs and even NVMe. We have one cache that is NVMe only um, in Kansas City inside the network backbone. So we have a wide spread of different types of technologies in the caches. If I were to build one inside Amazon, I would probably build it in one of the large, um, uh, the, the large, um, uh, there are VMs. I might actually build it out of a VM rather than S3 um, because Amazon charges for um, acts for IOPS, and in some of our customers, the IOPS heavy, um, and so they would pay through the nose for the IOPS, and therefore it's better uh, for us to. And there's no real uh, uh, our caching software would per would perfectly scale out doing it with VMs with disk attached, and then just having multiple VMs and build clusters. The largest cache we've built is a petabyte. And it's, I think, um, built out of, uh, I want to say, 200 disk systems or something like that, um, 200 SATA disks. So, uh, or maybe even more, I, I don't remember the, the uh, size. It's between two terabyte and 10 terabyte disks. So bottom line, um, we can make caching systems in AWS out of VMs that have uh, SATA disks attached. Great, um, and I think we're at time. So I wanna thank you so much, Frank Vertvine, for being um, our presenter today. It was a great presentation. I'm sure everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, thank you all for joining us during the seminar series. You can find um, this recorded session as well as Frank's slides and other resources on our AWS Education Research Seminar Series homepage. You can also find upcoming sessions. We will be having one per month, so we hope that you can join us for those future sessions as well. Have a great day. And Marcy, can I say one last thing? Of course. Um, I realize now that I should have put contact information into my slides. Can we fix this um, uh, offline and then uh, and uh, I give you a new version? Absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.